Okay, great. Um, thank you everyone for joining in. I think there's a lot of stuff that is going on on the everyone sort of, uh, I think overall progressing into the advanced prototyping phases. So are we at the moment? Uh, there are a bunch of other designs that are floating around. I believe uh, uh, some of the engineers at Tata as well sort of tried to seek it and were able to achieve some great results. Uh, at least from what we understand their documentation that we've seen. So we are also trying to get in touch with them. Any of you, if you are in touch with them, please also connect so that we can learn better. Um, and then there are, I think, uh, yeah, some more designs that we're also sort of seeing. But in terms of a couple of dates from uh, our end in Goa, uh, of the first one that I want to start with is that uh, we've got Cambridge University officially on board. Uh, uh, the Department of Distributed Manufacturing and also the Business School. Uh, a couple of professors, uh, Professor Jadeep and Professor Bokesh are helping us with uh, structuring the quality control and the quality assurance process of a distributed manufacturing uh, you know, way of manufacturing, especially if anybody wants to make it anywhere in the country, how do we sort of uh, you know, put that in order uh, they're also uh, looking at studying the M19 Collective and what the progress is going to happen uh, in the next couple of weeks in terms of how we do this in India. Uh, just for people who are new to the call, uh, uh, Cambridge University researchers last year also uh, did uh, two papers on the M19 Collective and the face shield effort that we did uh, last year as well. So this year as well, they've sort of come on board to really uh, help us out in terms of structuring some of these data points while we, of course, uh, do the prototyping and the making uh, as we go along. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, we've had some progress on the engineering, uh, but not uh, as much as we were hoping by today. Uh, but I'm going to leave that to Anul to uh, sort of talk about in the next couple of minutes uh, once I finish my updates as well from here. Uh, in terms of the number of labs that are registered at the moment uh, are about 136 across the country and we have more and more people joining in. So again, the communication is getting a little bit more structured. Uh, what we're primarily waiting for is the lab testing results. Uh, while we've lined up some clinical trials in the next couple of days, if we get everything up and running in Goa, uh, at least from our standpoint, I don't know if I'm missing anything, Weber, we would like to add. Or I'm no, good. That's okay. okay, that's a little bit of update from uh, our end over here, and uh, uh, I think uh, a lot of really great progress is going on. We're hoping to start funding more labs as we're also raising more funds, and hopefully this lab testing results is what we're really waiting for because it's gotten a little frustrating in the last two days. Uh, uh, you know, for us as well, because the humidity in Goa has increased drastically because there are rains starting right now. And to control the humidity and the output is becoming a massive challenge uh, with not the best zeolite that we have at the moment. Uh, but I'm going to let uh, Anul, of course, speak about that a little bit later. Uh, so that's a little quick update from our end. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to, actually, before I pass it on to Anul, I actually want to also um, say hi to da uh, Dara, uh, who's joined in from the UK. Uh, you want to say hi to the, to the group? Hi, good evening. Uh, yes, uh, I'm from an organization called 3D Crowd, and we are, well, we're here to help in any way that we can. Thank you so much, Dara, for joining. I just wanted to sort of introduce us. Uh, Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to introduce you uh, because I met Anthony and Dara a couple of days back. Uh, we were just discussing how the UK distributed manufacturing network uh, could possibly, you know, bring in some help. Uh, we also started uh, talking about uh, the flow meter 3D printed uh, piece that we were, you know, chatting the other day about that if they could, you know, do some of that for us while, of course, we openly uh, sharing that uh, particular project, which is a uh, offshoot of the oxygen project as well. So we were having those conversations. So really glad to see you, Dara. Thank you so much for joining and listening into us. Uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Anul. Anul, you would like to update from an engineering perspective and give everyone an update. Okay, so there are two main challenges. I think that uh, not just us, but everyone else is facing. 
first is uh, humidity. Uh, second is the quality of the zeolite used. Now for the humidity, we have managed it quite well today. We have brought it down to less than 10%. I think less than 5% is uh, what's going inside our sieves. Uh, the way we did it is not how it would eventually work in the field, but since we're doing more of an experiment here to see what works, what doesn't work, we wanted that uh, as a control. So we want to make sure that we are using uh, as much uh, dry air as uh, possible. So using a combination of uh, copper cooling coils, some cold water, a couple of uh, moisture separation stages, three of them in fact, and a one desiccant chamber, which contains uh, 13x desiccant, not to be uh, confused with 13x zeolite, because uh, this desiccant is specifically meant to absorb moisture. And uh, so we have that, we have some activated charcoal and all of that at the end of it from about 77 to 80% humidity that we are seeing here in Goa right now. We are getting it down to 5% that's uh, reaching inside our sea. So that's the good news. Uh, we not, like I said, that all of it is not uh, kind of something that we can do in the field, but we'll kind of uh, reach that uh, uh, stage later. We'll cross the bridge when we reach there. So that's uh, one part on the humidity control. The other is uh, the zeolite. So we've tried a couple of things. We've tried different kinds of sieve uh, uh, geometries. We've tried different kinds of construction. Uh, and no matter how, uh, how, how different you try, let me see if I can share a screen with you, uh, which I should just uh, do that. All right, while well, I get Richard's attention. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just want to show you quickly. So here's what the, what the timing diagram for the uh, oxygate looks like. Essentially, the, the, the charge, the purge and charge cycles keep going on for a much longer time. And then for a short duration, we have the equalization well, that does uh, some crossover charging from one to the other, and so on. So, uh, playing around with these timings, here's. Uh, okay, so essentially, you end up playing with these three numbers and the, the difference between an untuned system, which can give you 20.9% oxygen, which means no, uh, no concentration at the output, we can bring it up to about 60 to 65%, depending on how we tune the uh, numbers. So that's uh, uh, an important thing to, to have learned uh, over today is a slight amount of uh, tuning in these numbers can uh, change and improve your uh, output. But having said that, uh, end of the day, I think the zeolite we have is maxed out at the 65% uh, value. There is nothing more that we can squeeze out of it given the current conditions. Which uh, brings us back to square one, that we need uh, better zeolite or something that is uh, more appropriate or suited. Right now, the one that we have is of a unproven common uh, uh, I mean, we don't have the data sheet for it, or actually the, the supplier has given us a data sheet, but we're not sure if what he has supplied is actually what's written on the data sheet. So uh, we're trying to get that sorted, but as of now, the zeolite we have is maxing out at 65% uh, of the concentration. And then over the last couple of days, we have also managed to build our own oxygen analyzer. Uh, none of the ones that we've ordered online have yet arrived. Goa is a difficult place to get stuff uh, delivered. But we have used the Honeywell sensor and we have calibrated it using 99.6% uh, oxygen and 20.9% uh, oxygen. We had a friend here in Moira who gave us uh, uh, cylinders. He's a diver, so he has all of these uh, different uh, gas mixes uh, which are calibrated. 
So uh, using that, it was uh, kind of fairly easy to, to calibrate our sensor. We were also able to cross check it with another analyzer that he brought uh, for us to test. So, so we now have a good handle on the, on the measurement part. Uh, We've been making some small tweaks here and there. We've been 3D printing some stuff to you know, uh, make our build uh, better. Like today, we used a set of uh, aluminum sieves that were machined in Bombay by Gorbachev and that he sent to us. And uh, we needed some 3D printed parts made for it. So we've done all of that, the uh, uh, sieve parts and so on. So, uh, I guess that's uh, that's where we are. And for anyone else who has reached with about 80, 85 percent, uh, you might have some good results if you start tweaking with the numbers on your uh, Arduino code. Uh, and speaking of the Arduino code, that's the other thing that we are working on. Uh, this code uses what are known as uh, delay statement statements. These are essentially uh, blocking statements, which uh, kind of uh, make your microcontroller useless for any other task while it's doing this job. And we would also like the same microcontroller to eventually measure the oxygen and the temperature and humidity and so on. So we are going to refactor the code, rewrite it using non-blocking statements using ISR or maybe even just use millis instead of delay and, you know, Kind of improve it overall, so that's work in progress. Uh, Vijay is working on it. Um, so that's on the code part. We've covered the analyzer, we've covered the zeolite, uh, we've covered the uh, moisture capture. I think uh, that's about it. Have I missed anything, Weber? No, I think you've covered everything. So that's uh, great. I think Derek wanted to say something. Go ahead, Derek. Yeah, please. Um, I just had a, a couple of questions. Um, you're saying you were getting 50s, mid 50s percent oxygen concentration out of the system at the moment, 56 percent? Around, uh, around 62 to 64. So. 62, sorry, I missed that. Um, the, the TATA uh, program looks like it's getting 92. That's right. Using ostensibly an oxy kit. Right. Um, and so the, the, the real difference is the, the zeolite. They're using really small diameters, so, uh, 0.3 yeah. to 0.6. Is, uh, is, that, is that the only thing you think uh, that's the issue? Not really. So we, we looked at the Tata design, and uh, they've done something that is uh, what we were planning and what we have also done, and that is to improve the, uh, the cooling of the compressed air that comes out of the compressor because it's quite hot. And uh, we can only capture moisture from it once we cool it down sufficiently. So mm -hmm. uh, compared to the original oxygen, the Tata uh, copper cooling system, as well as ours, is uh, much, much longer. Uh, in our case, just for the purpose of trials, we have also additionally put it under some ice-cooled water to make sure that uh, we can really cool the moisture and then hopefully uh, we'll grab the moisture out of it. Really, Sometimes work the condensing coals yep. makes sense. Um, yep. The the other thing was that they're using um, a silica instead of a zeolite to try and pre-dry the mixture as well. Right, that's right. Um, I've seen a couple of discussions saying that the silica lasts a matter of you know minutes. Yes, um, uh, and I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, so uh, the. The desiccant uh, zeolite that we got was uh, from a, a diver friend, and based on his uh, usage, I mean, he has been using this for quite a long time because uh, they need to fill uh, dry air in their uh, oxygen tanks or whatever they do with diving. But in any case, he says uh, this should last much, much longer. Now, how much longer is uh, something we will have to empirically find out, I guess, once we start using it. But he was confident that it will be much, much better than silica gel. So okay. that's um, one the second last. stage. The last one, the other change that Tata made yeah. was uh, to use a higher powered compressor. So they're using something like three horsepower, uh, which is what we have also done today. So Sure. And I, I, guess, I guess that's because they're basically working the compressors less hard, so you end up with cooler air coming in. I don't think so, because uh, since these are untanked compressors, uh, they run continuously. Ah, they have right. run all the time. Right, okay. Um, the, 
the 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 one thing I would say about silica versus zeolite is how do you tell what's a good way to tell when you need to refresh the zeolite. So with the zeolite, the way we've been told is uh, it kind of clumps up because it absorbs moisture, uh, mm. and as against uh, regenerative silica, which changes color from blue to pink, for example. Uh, but yeah, I mean we're still new to that, so we need to yeah. dig in deeper to see how to you know get a better number on that. Maybe if you were able to um, uh, have the the container with the the desiccant zeolite in, uh, if you had that on a set of scales and you weighed it periodically um, to figure out when it's become, you know, uh, that would to regenerate be, it. Yeah, something that like that be, could be the uh, could be a very simple way to do it. Indeed, I think so. We should be able to do something like that. We can't probably do it while the machine's running, but we can uh, occasionally, you know, remove it and measure it on a big scale and see uh, what's happening. That's a good idea. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Arjun. You had something to say. Yeah, I just want to ask in terms of knowing the quality, the quality of the zeolite and when to replace it. Shouldn't the um, oxygen concentration values that we get out of a machine be very indicative of that? Like when the zeolite needs changing? Oh, yes, it does. I mean, if you have a system that's tuned and it's producing, let's say 90, 92% uh, to start with, and you notice that keeps going down uh, with everything else being the same, your compressed uh, air pressure supply is the same, your uh, humidity is more or less the same, uh, then yes, as the uh, Output concentration goes down. It is an indication that you're getting more moisture into the zeolite. Uh, if you remember, the oxygen actually uses a lower part of the sieve as a sacrificial uh, moisture capture layer. Uh, so pretty soon, the, the efficiency does uh, definitely go down. Okay, perfect. So Anul, is that it from our end in terms of the engineering update? Uh, yeah, I guess so. I mean, we've made lots of little tweaks here and there. Like I said, we worked on the code, we worked on some parts here and there, but I think we will probably be updating all of it on the Git repo and other places uh, shortly. Uh, also, yeah, at this point, let me uh, probably put this idea out something that maybe Richard can also talk about later is we are figuring out a way to collate all of this data that we are generating because I'm making changes in my system and I know what the system is built of. So I can kind of note it down and you know get the numbers and see what makes the best sense in terms of uh, timing uh, based on what zeolite I've used and stuff like that. But it would be useful to have the same comparisons from other labs around the country and eventually have a huge uh, database that uh, could benefit all of us in the long run. So it might make uh, tuning a system easier if I made a system that is similar to what uh, diverse labs have made in Chennai, then I just use their values and I'm good to go, which may be different from the oxygen values, for example. So I think we have a form uh, ready, but there's some slight uh, changes, which I'll discuss with Richard and probably by Monday or so we should have it uh, ready. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Ankit, you wanted to say something? Yeah, hi. Um, so regarding the cooling of copper coil, so uh, there are two ways of placing the fan. So one is right uh, at the bottom of the coil, like we have seen in the oxygen uh, photograph. Right. And right. the other way that we have seen uh, in one of the photographs is to put it at a peripheral, uh, at a lateral position. Right. So that, you know, we have both. Uh, that, uh, we have so both which, fans running. So which configuration works better? <laughs> like I said, we have both the fans running. We have one at the bottom and one across the coil. We also have a secondary larger coil that's uh, dipped in ice water at the moment. So, so here's the thing with uh, moisture. Uh, separating it or removing it from air becomes much easier the cooler the air you get because then you can literally condense it. So the easiest way is to get your air as cool as possible. So one of the other things you're going to try tomorrow is well, we have a laser cutter, we are a maker space and the laser cutter needs a chiller. So we're going to use the chiller that the laser uses to uh, cool our air and see how uh, things go from there. And, then maybe we'll see if we can come out with a decent enough way of you know cooling this air. We have been toying at uh, things like using uh, AC evaporator coils from uh, cars, for example, or motorcycles, uh, maybe radiator coils, stuff like that. So, but right now everything here is cool, so we can't kind of get hold of anything that is uh, in in junk, for example. We can't get a radiator coil. So the ideas are there, but we don't have the means to do that. 
and uh, regarding the compressor cooling the compressor so are you putting a radiator or something or it's just post convection uh, using a not not on the compressor and i think someone asked on the e group also about if we run the compressor long enough but yeah we've been running a compressor pretty much continuously for the last 4 uh, 5 days uh, with some short breaks in between for lunch and stuff stuff like that but yeah i mean it it runs fairly okay for uh, several hours at a stretch without uh, uh, Without an issue, but of course, adding a fan uh, to the compressor heads would be a good idea in the long run, eventually. But uh, as of now, we don't need it in Goa, and we aren't doing any additional cooling for the compressor per se. Okay, and at one very LPA, uh, so, sorry to interrupt. At what LP are you getting these results? Uh, sorry, come again. At what LP? At uh, LPA uh, uh, liters per minute. Uh, are you getting all these results that you're telling? Oh, ah, okay. So, uh, so the compressor we have is a 270 LPM compressor with a 50 liter tank. It's uh, two horsepower, but we have also coupled a third head to it to increase the uh, overall, uh, uh, let's say, compressing power that we have. So we now have so slightly. I mean, we are able to achieve, let's say, about eight bar, sorry, six bar. Around six bar continuously. No, no, no. I am asking something, something different. Uh, when the, the liters per minute is about two fifty. No, uh, not the external one. I am asking at the uh, when you uh, the flow meter when you have attached at the end. Oh, got you at the output. You mean? Yeah. All right. That I think uh, is somewhere between twelve to fifteen LPA. This is what we are seeing. That's at, that's great. Then. That's at, great. At sixty-two uh, percent concentration. That's great, then. Yeah, so I mean that's what we feel. We feel at the moment. I think it could be a, a it could be the zeolite. So that's what we're trying to sort of figure out as well. Hopefully, let's see. Yeah, um, I think LPM. Uh, we also reached up to twenty. Yeah. When we had a slightly higher pressure, if I remember. Yes, uh, but I mean, out of uh, sheer caution, we're not really running it that high. But yeah, I yeah. think we can definitely do twenty if we crank things up. Now that we have the aluminum sieves, we can actually probably try that as well tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when you reach to twenty, uh, so there's a decrease in the purity, or uh, is it constant? Oh, we haven't really tried that uh, high LPM yet. So we'll know tomorrow once we do it. Let's All right. Say, there's a graph that uh, usually tells, and many of the advanced prototype people have also suggested this that uh, once you increase the LPM, uh, the purity decreases. So yeah, I, I think that's even a logical thing to to think about. Like you know. Like if we uh, take down the LPM that we are getting now to about five LPM, I'm sure we'll get about eighty, ninety percent for sure. But that's not what we need. So that's that's it. Okay, perfect. Priyank, you had a question. Yeah. So I have two questions. Uh, I just uh, I just had my first prototype running today, Great. and couple of couple of issues which I am facing, and I'm not sure what are uh, many people are facing or not. I have a very heated compressor after 25 minutes. It doesn't shut down. Uh, I ran for 45 minutes. Then I felt that I should shut down, or else I will lose the compressor and I won't have any testing from tomorrow. But it is heating What's up your, like What's anything. your ambient temperature, Priya? No, uh, ambient temperature. I'm not working in an AC. I don't have an AC lab. But yeah, I, it's uh, it, it will be around 35, 36. Neither are we. I didn't get it. We are at about the same temperature. Maybe a little higher. We are at about the same temperature here. So yeah. Sometimes even a little bit higher. Yeah. Uh, uh, we and, don't have an AC either. It's out in the open. It's pretty hot. Uh, yeah. So I have a very pretty hot compressor as well as pretty hot cooling coil. Uh, at after running for thirty-five minutes, I was not able to uh, touch mm -hmm. the compressor as well as cooling coil. Even the cooling coil, I was not able to touch it. It was that hot. Yeah, the cooling coil. Yeah, the cooling coil definitely gets pretty really hot. It it becomes uh, hot that you can't touch it at the input side, but the output of the cooling coil is pretty cold, in fact. So, oh, uh, that's been our observation. Okay, so I'm not uh, regarding wrong. your compressor. Maybe it is is a, it a tank? Is it a tank? Sorry, is your no, compressor a, with a tank or without a tank? No, no, no. It's a 1.5 HP direct uh, direct compressor. It is same as a dental air compressor, but with no tank. And second thing, I am getting uh, more try, try doing your. 
try doing experiments at lower pressure to ease out on the compressor. Maybe you know, uh, just make sure that you work on the the concentration first and then work on the LPM. Perfect. Yeah. And uh, second thing is, I've just I just bought a, a, a Veganar uh, evaporator coil. It was available in my the, it's a car uh, evaporator coil. But I'm not a mechanical engineer. I put in the hot compressor into it, and I was getting droplets of water on the side. I, I had, a, I guess, I had a talk uh, before also, but I'm not sure. You uh, should I mm -hmm. use it or not? So, if someone from the engineering team, so here's could... the thing. Uh, so here's the thing. Once you have a cooling coil or whatever, there is uh, moisture or water that's actually being formed there. So what you need after that is something that's technically known as the pressure dropout. Uh, sometimes it's also known as a moisture separator. So essentially you send the output of the radiator to something that can collect that moisture. Otherwise it's going straight into your system. So you need a, another device after the coils or after the radiator to gather all of that uh, water that's coming out of there. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thanks. Just look for a moisture separator as part of the pneumatic uh, supplies. Uh, I have... I have two moisture separators. One is the filter uh, pressure regulator, and one is the hydrant uh, moisture uh, moisture capture. And I am getting no moisture in both of them. There are no water droplets, nothing. So I think that after running for thirty five minutes, I would have destroyed the zeolite because all the moisture would have gone into zeolite because uh, I'm not getting even a droplets of water in both of them. Well, that's uh, that's quite odd because we are kind of filling up a glass within about an hour or so. Hour or two hours, I think we fill up a whole glass of water. That's the amount of moisture we are removing from the moisture separator. So we don't have so much moisture today. Is only thirty-eight percent in the uh, environment. Naturally, it is thirty-eight percent. So we don't have oh, okay. that kind of moisture in the environment. Also, but yeah, I'm not getting even a droplet. So I exactly. guess I'm not cooling it enough to get the moisture. I made that to be the reason. Yeah, I mean you can grab the uh, you can convert moisture. Should water only once you cool it sufficiently to reach its uh, yeah. viewpoint. For example, uh, I will try something, Jogar. Let's see. Okay, thanks, Priyank. Okay, Arjun, uh, you have another question. Yeah, I just like two small questions. One, I just want to ask, uh, where are you based, Priyank? Are you in Delhi? Rajkot. Priyank okay. is in Rajkot. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, uh, talking about cooling. Um, in the next month and two, the temperatures are going to rise, especially in North India, quite significantly. I think you should keep that also in mind because whatever testing we do, it should keep in mind that temperatures are going to keep rising. And like right now, it's pretty bearable. But by the time things actually start rolling out and scaling, it's going to be 45 plus in Delhi. Yeah, um, it's it's pretty unbearable in Goa at the moment. It's pretty hot. So and we, you have the you have crazy humidity also. So yeah, imagine. it's humid, it's hot. So both factors are really and heat uh, is not going to change anything too much. Heat might not, but the moisture will. Moisture will moisture will affect, yeah. but heat will not. Anul, am I right on that? I think he's off. Okay. Okay. So I think moisture will start being a thing then when monsoon starts coming. Yes. 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 That's what moisture definitely. Uh, heat probably not. And Anul can also comment on that if he thinks. Though, Sorry, I missed that. Come again. Yeah, so we do, you were, think, yeah. do you think heat is going to play a, uh, a role in uh, the same? Or is it going to be uh, just the moisture? Oh, well, heat is generally not good, that's for sure. I mean, it's going to make sure make your compressor more difficult to manage. Your compressed air is going to get even more hotter at the outlet side. So, uh, cool. no. it's going to I, I guess the, more. the moisture separation is dependent on the heat management. Yeah. So, so uh, there are six teams working in Gujarat in small malls clusters, and five of them have issues of compressing shutting down after 35 minutes due to heat. At least right. in Gujarat, this is an issue that right. it is heating up and compressor is shutting down after 30 minutes, 25 minutes. So I guess you know your solution would be to uh, get bigger compressors and use them, uh, let's say, conservatively so that they don't uh, heat up. I would like to add here, uh, my compressor is not heating at all. Uh, using the, uh, this, what do you call that? Container, uh, what is that? Tank, tank. Tank, 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 I have the tank. So you can use that also. Abhimani, quick question uh, on your setup. Are you working inside an AC room? 
by any chance? Abhimanyu? Hello, uh, can you repeat? Yeah, no, I was saying that your setup, are you in a non-AC or an AC kind of environment? Non, non-AC, yeah, cooler, cooler. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. okay. So, uh, I would like to give you an update. Uh, so, uh, so, I helped another maker out here in Delhi to get the percentage till uh, 93 uh, at uh, 5, 6 LPM. So, they were stuck at 30. Nice. So, that is an update from my side. Oh, nice. So, so that was the, uh, was, the what was the change? Code or, yeah, I mean, that's my question again. What was the change? It's all about the timing. There's some formulas uh, that Mahir shared, and it's all about the timings. It is not about, apart from the moisture, it's all about the timings. That okay, is the yeah. trick. Uh, that are you willing trick. to share your uh, yeah, 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 knowledge yeah. with us? Uh, yeah, you know? I, I guess uh, he has already shared those things. Uh, so. Cool. Sorry, who's the lab, by the way, Abhimanyu, that you're talking about? Uh, this is, uh, well, I don't know the name of the lab, but I know the name of the people. Uh, these are students. Uh, who's the and all. I, I don't to... know if they, uh, they haven't registered uh, on okay. uh, this. Anirudh, yeah. Anirudh in Delhi is what you're saying? Uh, yeah, Anirudh. these people are, uh, haven't uh, registered with you guys. So they okay. don't know about it. Okay, got it. Yeah. So uh, uh, this is uh, what they have, uh, what Mahir shared that this is a formula that uh, 0 0.1125, uh, like uh, the flush delay into 0 0.1125. Uh, sorry, uh, the initially you have uh, the activation time, production time that is. Okay. Yes, I lost him. No, I think, he, uh, sorry, uh, Abhimani, could you unmute yourself? Sorry. Someone yeah. muted me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, these are the magic numbers. So 5171, uh, whatever that number is, like if you have a 5,000 or 1,000, then you multiply it with a 0. 0.1125 to get the flush delay. And to get the pre-charge, you multiply it with 0. 0.175. Uh, I don't know the logic behind this. Huh, someone uh, wrote those down. Yeah. On the chat also. Okay, yeah, I think I can see that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I shared it with other people also. I got this on uh, the fine tuning group or any like. Mahir okay. shared it directly with me. Nice. Okay, nice. That's awesome. So that sort of helped the tuning to ninety three percent. So, so uh, uh, Anul, it's all about the timing. It's all yeah, about as, the timing. As I mentioned earlier today, I mean that's what we did. We had a system that wasn't doing anything because we had changed the AC and everything. It was a totally different geometry. So we got it up to 62, 65. So what I'm uh, at is like, uh, so the different people working at different pressure and with different volumes of C when there's so many parameters, I'm trying to uh, have all that data with me. I'm trying to decode these formulas if we could uh, generalize it and finally apply it to the Indian people. The Indian market. Totally, uh, really cool is uh, with Vijay. I can send Vijay could put it in his LabVIEW software. Yeah. Uh, LabVIEW, he's actually created an entire little workspace where he can put all these timing cycles and really model the entire simulation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I wanted to share my data also. Like I've collected with each and every guy, like from Bombay, from Chennai, from Priyank also, from each or every person whom I personally know or have connected out here from the MI, kit, MI people also and from other people also who are independently working. So I've tried to maintain that. Nice. Okay. We'll uh, get that data as well. Okay. That's awesome. Thanks. Uh, I've got a couple more people who raised their hands. So Vinod, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah. Uh, my question is for Anul. Yeah. Uh, I just want to understand uh, the zeolite canister. What mm -hmm. all the things you have filled in the same canister? Only it is containing only zeolite, or you have filled your activated charcoal and other items as a part of that canister? So there are two things. One is a zeolite that's doing the nitrogen adsorption, which is okay. for as per what the exocet uh, requires. Okay. Uh, similar construction. Okay. Uh, we also made an aluminum uh, based sieve, which is uh, not so similar to oxygen, but. Uh, Pretty much the same principle. Let's say I can. I think we'll post details of it in a day or two once we. Okay. Are... So this is all in the same cylinder, or 
separate no separate so thing. so we have a separate uh, a fourth canister which is what we are calling as a desiccant uh, sieve which contains the moisture absorbed it's of it's of being desiccant and the activated charcoal so that's cool. a fourth sieve in addition to the two uh, main uh, nitrogen absorption sieves and the search tank so totally there are four tanks now okay okay i got it so this activated charcoal is placed before the uh, before the zeolite uh, canister right yes that's true okay uh, vivian you want to go next uh, hi uh, uh, my question is to anul anul i was yeah. going through the code that you shared right uh, like uh, basically i believe that you are doing a trial and error with the uh, delay uh, numbers right right okay uh, why don't you just add a kind of a, a, a rotary encoder with the two inputs on the uh, uh, for the arduino uh, okay. two different ones and then uh, try to fine tune the numbers yeah i mean uh, we could have done that as well except that we don't have rotary encoders on hand right now right now it's like a situation where we have to work with what we have so okay. or maybe even a potentiometer and then uh, yeah, uh, so convert the values it's gone a little bit better that's what uh, we have mentioned we have written a code in labview which is uh, thanks to vijay and uh, we have a nice panel which can uh, in which we have dials to control the timing that gets loaded onto the arduino which it is real time so okay. we can set the parameters independently for the uh, the timing cycles plus we can uh, connect the oxygen sensor and see what's happening at the output and you know, plot graphs and so on so i think uh, we are going to release uh, uh, executables for that particular setup so that everyone can use it uh, with their system that will be pretty interesting okay Thank you. Um, uh, can also, you elaborate what's the what's the theory behind this rotary encoder that you're saying? I didn't get it quite up. Uh, in the sense, uh, for the uh, uh, delay timing, uh -huh. we use a rotary encoder. You can uh, uh, use it to fine tune the timing. That is what I was suggesting. Yeah. So that you, uh, uh, when you keep turning it, it, the system is on, and it can change the values on each uh, loop. Yeah. So okay. Right, right. Okay. So oh, when so you're just... measuring the oxygen concentration, you will actually know. that uh, whether it's increasing or decreasing or whatever okay. yeah i just wanted to add to that that what we were doing today was uh, i mean we, i was changing the arduino code but it was happening pretty much in in real time it was getting about as fast as uh, changing a potentiometer but uh, i also got a good sense of what numbers i'm using and noting them down so okay. there has been some kind of a uh, thought behind the process you know just randomly changing numbers but kind of uh, noting down what happens when we change something and you know i think that that documentation is uh, an important part of the process uh, so i have maybe, one thought okay okay please. yeah sorry go ahead ankit because there's something else that i have to pick up uh, with regard to vivian okay so in context to real time tuning only so i have one idea so uh, at the at the output of the purge tank when the let's say the canister a is purging out uh, can we have an oxygen sensor and it can feed real time data to the arduino that okay now uh, the nitrogen has you know Plus, doubt and oxygen is starting to flush out. So, at so that the, time, so the trouble with uh, sensors is that uh, the electrical ones have what's known as a response time. It's not fast enough for us to be able to use it. Uh, okay, the okay, ones, okay. in fact, we are using have something like a ten second or fifteen second cycle time. Oh. You can get better sensors which can respond in real time, but then they would be beyond our pockets at the moment. So, I have that one. Uh, the one that I purchased for thirty thousand bucks. Yes. Yeah. It's a bit real time, but I was planning for this. What the users telling? So, if we could attach those, uh, so that the, we can. The other create. trouble with is not only are these sensors expensive, but they also don't last forever. Like at the most, uh, I mean, they're rated for a certain number of uh, oxygen volume hours, but I think in real life they'd be like about a year or two, and you have to replace them. So, uh, long term, not a good solution. Really. Okay. At this point, I just wanted to say I think uh, Vivian has done some work also on making a schematic and a, a circuit board for the controller. But uh, I had other ideas, so maybe Vivian and me, and if others are interested, we can have a, a more specific electronic uh, chat maybe tomorrow or the after. Focus okay. on the electronics okay. of the cog circuit. So Vivian, maybe Vivian, maybe you can schedule that with uh, the electronics folks if you would like to take that up. Uh, okay, fine, not a problem. 
that'd be great thank you yeah. anul i will talk to you and then we will share yeah. it yeah, yeah please because i have a couple of ideas but i want to throw it around and bounce it before we kind of reach a consensus uh, richard uh, can i have one second just one second yeah go ahead priyank yeah uh, uh, anul just one question at one i saw a code it is 1900 milliseconds what is the yeah. pressure uh, pressure when you charge the canister for 1900 seconds uh the input pressure we are maintaining below 4 bar the the cus themselves are charging up to about 2 uh, Two bar or or two two point two bars roughly, but these okay. are smaller sieves. They hold about nine hundred and fifty grams of steel like roughly. Okay, okay, perfect. Which is why I have to you know change the timings so drastically. So I I am getting two bar pressure at twenty two hundred, but I have a fifty percent of the canister size of Maher. Yeah, so uh, that makes sense. It is a smaller okay. canister. You need to reduce your production uh, timing. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, great. A uh, couple of other things I wanted to add before we sort of uh, go deep dive, and I think we have just about fifteen minutes to close the call, so I just want to be mindful. So, quick things. Uh, uh, we've also shared, I think, two other open source projects that are floating around. One is the IIT Bombay one, which is on the uh, rebreather, uh, which is also there on the group, and the other one is the oxygen flow meter, which is uh, made. Uh, in collaboration with fractal and uh, fezzel which is also there on the group but we'll start uh, we'll start uh, uh, we'll share the notion page as well tomorrow so that you can see all of this in one section so that if any anyone wants to sort of work on these on the parallel that'd be great we have one more which we're working on which is the oximeter using samsung phone um, you know thing uh, which is a separate parallel group going on so a couple of uh, other folks are sort of working on that piece where uh, apparently the uh, samsung phones do have a pulse oximeter uh, um, uh, feature and uh, there is something going on between um, professor ramesh from mit media labs and the group on how we could possibly use that for you know um, they, a lot of people have been telling us that there's an oximeter issue in rural areas so that's the piece that the other project is also working so there are three parallel uh, uh things that are also happening apart from the ox uh, oxykit m19 oxykit group so uh, one the iit bombay one the fractal oxy uh, the fractal and fezzel oximeter uh, and the other one is the samsung oximeter again so a couple of the, just wanted to let the t uh, everyone know in case anyone's interested can also reach out and possibly by tomorrow i'll have this sort of documented better sorry is a fractal a oximeter or a flow meter sorry flow meter my bad yeah, okay. yeah flow meter uh okay anul uh, before you go can i ask abhi to uh, actually pitch in abhi you want to go yeah just one quick thing about oximeter i think uh, since we tested uh, that uh, the samsung devices does work with the samsung health app uh would it make sense actually if somebody can create a like a full end to end video like and put it on youtube on how to use it and then we can socialize that while we actually do the other exercise about identifying the devices and then come because they'll take few days maybe weeks right yeah. uh people can use that help right now and i don't know how many folks in villages would know about this and just having a video out there and socializing it might help uh, you know folks uh, to get in control Sure, fair. We can suggest that on the oximeter group as well, and maybe uh, we can check for volunteers who can take that up. Uh, I just want, uh, okay, uh, before Arjun and before Anu will go, I think Dipesh, did you have your hands up for something? Yeah. So uh, Abhi, I think Samsung already has like a video on that feature. So in case we don't want to waste any time making another video, maybe we could just use that because. it's pretty much them explaining how to use their device does that work awesome uh, we just need to then socialize it i guess uh, through whatever means uh, makes sense dipesh uh, between cool. you and abhi i guess if you guys can just put that on the on the oximeter group that'll be great to just uh, get that rolling uh, cool. okay thanks maybe yeah so maybe we may have to regionalize regionalize it because uh, i think even closed captions or auto translate might not work if people can't even read uh, that stuff so maybe Uh, a spoken translation of what samsung is talking about yeah in regional languages yeah that'll be important yeah, yeah. fair 
Thanks, Anul. So, uh, could Abhi, you still have your hands up, so I don't know whether you still want to speak. No. Okay. Arjun, you want to go next? Yeah. yeah, I just want to ask, uh, in terms of the Samsung thing, I believe not all Samsung phones have this. I believe only the yeah. more expensive ones. So, for example, I just got a made in India Samsung, the cheaper ones. What I mean is, for a rural solution, I don't expect there to be a lot of Samsungs with oximeters floating around there already, if that's what you're depending on. So a lot of uh, input that we're getting over there is that a lot of second and third hand phones have sort of reached rural areas, which are Samsung as well. So and, uh, talking to and so we talked, so Ramesh, yeah. Professor Ramesh is also talking to Airtel and Geo and a few other telecom operators to get this data because they do have device data, right? So you can know where they are. So we try to sort of work on that, but apparently that's also the case that a lot of second and third hand phones are in the rural areas, which are Samsung, these certain um, upgraded versions, I think. The, the models with Doxy, yeah, that models. would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what yeah. we're sort of coming to. Okay, um, okay, quickly next. So yeah, I just wanted to sort of talk about these couple of projects. Abhimanyu, you wanna quickly uh, pitch in before I move on? So uh, there's one more finding that I could tell uh, the people who are uh, like at the advanced stages. Uh, normally, uh, the supply of two by two valve has been stopped by many people out there. So the two by two valve that you see is, uh, that you should you what they are uh, selling right now is a unidirectional valve, and you need to buy a bidirectional valve. So all those early makers who are right now doing all that. This needs to be there that the two by two wall should be bi-directional. There should not be any arrow. There should not be one and two. So that would uh, mess a lot. And they won't know even key. Uh, this is the problem that they're facing. This is the majority of problem that these people uh, also faced. Uh, the one that I corrected, they were having 30. Then they reached to 90. So this was also one issue sure. that they had. So a sourcing group can also make this thing clear that all the people out there who are selling, uh, they're selling two by two unidirectional. And when I ask them, Ki, what is this? Uh, so they're telling ki peaches in Arab. So no one has produced those. So all of them have finished. The one block we will have apart from you would be this. Okay, great. Yeah, you want to put that in the chat because I'm going to save the chat as well. Thanks. Uh, okay, perfect. Anul, you want to go next? Your hands raised. Yeah, quickly. I just wanted to ask the group if anyone's had success uh, talking to or reaching out to someone at Tata. That was one. Uh, to see what kind of uh, probably the magic at the end lies in the type of zero light being used, I guess, because all of us have built systems. We are able to reach a certain amount of concentration, but not what's required. So that was one. The other thing was someone asked if. Uh, uh, we can use activated alumina as uh, desiccant because it seems it can be used for heatless regeneration. That was uh, Raghavendra. So maybe if Raghavendra knows a bit more about this, you can just uh, kind of tell us what this whole thing is about. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, it's me, Raghavendra. I mean, uh, I just Googled it out uh, and found oh, okay. some articles where they're using uh, this activated alumina as a uh, for, I mean, heatless regeneration. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a similar system like this, I mean, oxygen kept, I mean, oxygen generating device. I mean, uh, it's a PSA system where uh, there are two chambers and uh, at a time, a single chamber is uh, yeah. uh, utilized here. Yeah. And another chamber is used for uh, regeneration. I mean, a part of dry air is passed through it and passed out. So. Okay. Uh, yeah, so basically, it's the same as the PSA, but except for nitrogen, we are now absorbing uh, moisture from air and uh, turning it into drier air. Uh, that makes sense, but I'm not sure how it will affect the, uh, the complexity and cost of our system, but it's something that I think probably we can at least try out as, a, as an experiment if, uh, if we can get hold of those uh, materials. So. Okay. Um... Okay, uh, I think Abhimanyu, uh, you had your hands raised. Please go ahead. So uh, I would like to add one more point. Uh, so from the pneumatics guy who was sourcing uh, all these products, so he told me to uh, use this vacuum thing, uh, vacuum wall. So with the low compressor also, you can increase the rate two or three times if you use this vacuum, this sort of a device that he gave me. 
so this is what buying also the company using the low compressor and they are using this vacuum thing showing you the photo on the group so that you can have a look okay cool thanks vinod you want to go next uh yeah uh, on the activated alumina thing actually we have purchased activated alumina uh, so by next week uh, we may able to come out with some this thing whether it is going to suit us or not oh well that i can confirm right away we have already used activated alumina and that's the uh, that's the 13x that we have which is an alumina based uh, desiccant and uh, like i said uh, we went down all the way to about i think less than 10% humidity i think even around 5% is uh, what we were measuring so uh, it definitely works the question is uh, how we can make it uh, user friendly in the sense that we don't have to change it uh, as often as it might require to be like if it has to be done every day that could be difficult if it's once a month we can somehow figure out a way to uh, to include that in our machine for example uh no what uh, we are planning is uh, we are planning an active uh, this thing uh, regeneration cycle for the activity okay. No. okay okay yep so that means additional valves and additional you know uh, timing cycles and saves yeah, and all of yeah. that so sure. sure perfectly doable but more expensive that's a, a factor for us too. okay great thanks vinod for that um Does anyone else? Because I have a couple of minutes before I close the call. If anybody else would like to ask anything or sort of give us an update from where you're joining, that'd be great. Uh, otherwise, it's been a fairly long day for us as well. So I'm going to call it a night soon. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Okay. Seems All like right. seems like it's a it's a uh, it's a wrap. So thank you everyone for joining tonight. Uh, we'll continue the call again tomorrow, hoping for better results and sharing that with all of you. So thank you so much for joining. All right, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Good night.